Welcome to Faith and Freedom. For the next few minutes, we hope to inform, inspire, and encourage you as we discuss the legal victories and challenges to your fundamental freedoms and religious liberties. Faith and Freedom comes to you from Liberty Council, a civil liberties education and legal defense organization. Join us now as Matt Staver, the President and General Counsel of Liberty Council, explains the latest legal issues all across this country in the courtrooms of America. Liberty Council is winning the battle for your constitutional freedoms. A federal court deals Obamacare a serious blow. I am Matt Staver, founder and chairman of Liberty Council and dean of Liberty University School of Law. We'll be talking about it today with Matt Barber, who is the associate dean of the law school and director of cultural affairs for Liberty Council. Matt, this judge, Judge Hudson, out of Richmond, Virginia, ruled that the Obamacare health care law is unconstitutional as it relates to the individual mandate, that there's no authority in the Constitution that would allow Congress to mandate every single person in America to purchase health insurance of a particular kind, that there's no authority, and consequently the individual mandate is gone. And, of course, that's going to be appealed up to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, where our case is currently pending. Well, that's right. If, if you visualize Obamacare as a house of cards, the individual mandate is a blanket, and it's uh, the house of cards is sitting on that blanket, and this judge has just yanked that blanket out from under the house of cards. So without the individual mandate, uh, all of Obamacare comes crumbling down. It really is. It's kind of analogous to having a car with a motor, and you've just removed the motor. Yeah. So it may look like a car still, but it's not going to act, operate, or a ship at sea with an engine that's gone out. We've seen several of those recently on TV where their ship engines yeah. have gone out, and you see it's basically helpless out there in the middle of the ocean. That's exactly what happened in this case. Now, he severed Section 1501 from the rest of the bill. There is no severability clause right. in this particular law, but there is a mechanism for a judge to mm -hmm. sever if there is... Um, a way to sever it and leave the rest of the law intact, or if there is an intent by Congress that this would, in fact, be something that could be moved out and stand on its own. He says it's hard to know exactly what Congress intended because they pushed this through all the way up through Christmas Eve. The Senate did. But he says just to be safe, he was going to sever it out because there's 400 other unrelated laws that's part of this particular bill. The fact of the matter is whether he severs it or whether he doesn't, the individual mandate is ruled unconstitutional, mm -hmm. and it is like taking the gas out of the engine. Yeah. It's just not going to work. The government has already said that everything hangs or falls on the viability of this mandate. If they cannot mandate everybody in America to purchase health insurance, then the entire system, as you're saying, the house of cards collapses. Well. And, and again, the judge here, as other judges have done, uh, both uh, Clinton appointees, uh, Bush appointees, Republican, Democrat. This isn't a uh, bipartisan or a, a partisan uh, thing here. He ruled that the the individual mandate is a gross overreach. You cannot, and and of course the the government is citing the Commerce Clause and the powers provided by the Commerce Clause in order to regulate inactivity in order to compel people to buy uh, goods or services, and that is unprecedented. Un under no other, at no other time in history has the government done that. And and the judge is just kind of engaged engaged in common sense here and said, hey, you cannot compel, using the Commerce Clause, people to engage in commerce who are otherwise sitting around doing nothing. Yeah, that's right. The uh, government's argument is that Congress can regulate some of the edges of health insurance, and they point to the McCarran-Ferguson Act, which that act basically essentially says that if employers provide health insurance, then there are certain requirements that they have to abide by. But then they go on to say, since they can regulate the edges, then obviously it can go even further. But this is a quantum leap further. Mm -hmm. The problem with this argument is... Yes, there is federal law that allows the government to regulate some of the extremities of health care. But the difference between that and this is they only have the opportunity to regulate the edges of health care requirements on employers if the employer chooses to provide health care. Mm -hmm. They cannot mandate an employer to buy health care, but if the employer gets into the business of providing health care to its employees, then certain things are required mm -hmm. of that provision. Here, what they're doing is they're saying, well, we are going to force you into the market. They justify this 
new uh, attempt by Congress to force people to do something that they're not doing by saying, if we don't force you to do it, if we don't require everybody to buy health insurance, then the rest of the system, the entire health industry, is going to come crashing down. So, therefore, we have the right to force you to buy health insurance. Well, that's right. The rest of the socialized health care scheme that they have created here would come crashing down. But we're not a nation with a history of, of socialized medicine. We're not an Eastern Bloc country. We're not Canada. We're not Great Britain. We have the best health care system in the world. It's flawed. It definitely needs improvement. But we need to have a conversation about real health care reform here that is that is workable, that doesn't take us down the path of socialized medicine. Now, Matt, another thing the judge ruled on here is this notion throughout the entire process, uh, the government was saying, if you do not uh, obey and engage in, in health, the health care uh, and, and in commerce in that sense, then we will issue a penalty against you. You will be penalized now in court. They're trying to, they're reversing course and saying, no, it's not a penalty, it's a tax, so that they can invoke the necessary and proper clause and, 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 and the ability of the government to, to tax people. Now they're changing. So again, this judge has said, no, you can't have it both ways. You've been saying all along it's a penalty. Now you want to call it a, a tax because it's, a, it's expedient. Now I'm not going to let, you know, we're not going to get away with that. Yeah, once they failed on the Commerce Clause, because this would be Commerce Clause by virtue of its nature, and this title mm-hmm. represents Commerce commerce. For the average person, even if you don't have a law background, commerce means or suggests that there's some kind of activity. You're you're producing something. You're you're buying something that is being transported in the stream of commerce. Here they're saying, well, even for those who are not participating, we're going to force you into the stream of commerce. Well, they lose on that. So then they say, well, well, what about the taxing and spending clause? Mm -hmm. We have a right to tax, and if we have a right to tax, we can put restrictions on it. The problem with that is the previous bills, they actually stated that Section 1501 was a tax. Mm -hmm. But the version that passed by the Senate in 2009 changed the word to a penalty. So it is a penalty for not having health insurance Mm -hmm not a tax. Now, there are other taxes within the bill, such as there's a tax on tanning salons. There's a tax on other kinds of things that they do um, that are completely unrelated to the mandate. But when you get to the mandate, it is not a tax. It actually is a penalty. That's what passed. Mm -hmm. And President Obama said this, everyone who knows, this is not a tax. This is a penalty. So now they try to switch gears and try to say, well, well, ma- wait a minute, it's a tax. And uh, the judge clearly said, no, it's not. Um, that would be disingenuous. It's contrary to the statute. It's contrary to the history of the statute. It's contrary to the representations by uh, the Democratic leaders and to President Obama that this, in fact, was a penalty, not a tax. Well, now, Matt, um, our friend, Attorney General, Virginia Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli, is saying that uh, they may try to uh, invoke, uh, what is it, Rule 11, I think, surpass the... Uh, 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 Fourth Circuit and go straight to the Supreme Court. Do you think there's any chance that'll happen? A and B, what do you think the chances are of combining uh, Liberty's lawsuit and Liberty Council's lawsuit with with Virginia's lawsuit? Well, it, it's a different rule than Rule 11. That that would be more of a sanctions rule. But okay. the um, Attorney General has made these comments that he would like to try to bypass the Court of Appeals and go directly to the United States Supreme Court. That would be a very unusual step indeed. Um, I don't know whether the Supreme Court would grant something like that. It's possible. Uh, We'll look into that as well. On the other hand, um, our case is already at the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. We already have a briefing schedule, and our brief is due in the middle of January. The government's brief is due 30 days after that, Mm -hmm. and then uh, we have a reply brief. So that's on a fast track already. And what I would imagine that would happen is both cases would probably be argued almost at the same time mm-hmm. and probably the same day. I don't think they're going to be consolidated in the mm-hmm. sense that there's only going to be one case because our case also we, challenges the employer mandate. Ours is a broader ours, challenge. Ours mm-hmm. includes a challenge to the individual mandate, but it also ensures short- the employer mandate is challenged, and then we have other constitutional provisions as well that the right. Attorney General doesn't have. Very good, yeah, and uh, we'll have to uh, get back with uh, 
the the attorney general uh, on that. I, I think he said on the radio today it was Rule Eleven. So yeah, the rule, yeah, yeah, it, it's a wrong rule, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, with all due respect to the attorney general, yes, but he, uh, the attorney general is a great attorney oh. and uh, very pleased to have him as an attorney general in the Commonwealth uh, of Virginia. Give us a call at Liberty Council at 1-800-671-1776 or go to Liberty Council's website, lc.org, for more information. At this time of year, since it's the year end, we not only cover your prayers but your financial support to be able to close out this year and prepare for the exciting opportunities and challenges ahead in 2011. You can make a year-end online contribution right there at Liberty Council's website, lc.org. That's lc.org. You have been listening to Matt Staver of Liberty Council. Our hope is to encourage and inspire you to stand up for your faith, family, and freedoms. We can accomplish a lot when we work together. Get informed and get involved today. Sign up for our free monthly newsletter, The Liberator. We will send it out to you free of charge. Stay informed with our Liberty Alert email update. Just click on the website at www.lc.org or call us at 1-800-671-1776. Tune in next time to learn more about your rights right here on Faith and Freedom. 